What is going on YouTube? Gavin is here and welcome to this year's episode of the Tech Pills end of the year show. So thanks to whatever is happening in the world right now, I'm doing this alone and besides I couldn't find the time to record this live so we're doing it the old style like a regular video. So with no further ado, let's start with this retrospective over a very weird year. So first thing we need to talk about is the human malware situation and what it meant for all of us. Uh, it was undoubtedly bad for the most part as uh, personally it effed up my university life completely since I had to uh, move back from Milan to my hometown and uh, of course not being at the university to study and to have the company and the um, confrontation with, uh, with classmates and having the possibility to study together, it really hurt me, particularly since I know how I work and I know I work better with other people. Um, and of course, that, that was pretty bad for me. Uh, of course, many other people probably suffered the same. If you're, if you're doing like school or university, you know what I'm talking about. But of course, that was like the least of evils uh, of this whole situation. Um, being lock locked up most of the time can take its toll on the mind and the spirit and it definitely did for me if it wasn't for the fact that most of the quarantine uh, I spent in Milan with my girlfriend I don't know how else I would have coped with the whole situation because um, it really it, it's really weird for a person that uses to go out every day if not for university even just to do mundane stuff like meeting with friends and whatever uh, and I've never really given given too much importance uh, to uh, to these like mundane things and all of a sudden once they stop or once they get so limited that they get like so frustrating to organize um, it's weird it's something that I would have never expected to see in my lifetime and again when every movement has to be planned ahead of time and when you have to deal with a-holes that don't respect any safety measures i mean it gets pretty old very fast and of course many lives have been taken by it and this is something that i just would have never imagined to witness in, in during my lifetime it's something that i can only compare in my mind to the 1600s plague and that honestly feels somewhat surreal to watch unravel fortunately it wasn't all bad um this whole human malware situation it brought with it some very interesting stuff uh in our everyday lives first of all in the work uh in the workspace in the work life of most people out there uh, work from home is now a thing uh, in many fields and with a much higher rate and much higher scale this of course meant that people got to spend more time with their family less time commuting and overall having the possibility to spend more time at home with your family or the people you care about it's definitely a good thing as for the tech sphere people finally woke up from uh, when it comes to personal computers we nerds love our pcs but not everyone understands how useful they are in the everyday life and uh, to us to us nerds they're an everyday tool but for most people they just use their phone and don't care too much about it. But as the market demonstrates, PC sales have gone uh, up and they were previously, like prior to this year, they were in a very uh, steep decline. But now they started, uh, the, the PC sales started growing again. And of course, this is for a good reason. Smartphones are technically computers, but they're not really computers. That's of course because of the software that runs on there and people just cannot do their work on smartphones and of course having the possibility to have a bigger screen and mouse and keyboard is a lot better than having to tap on a five inch screen or whatever now having a pc is not only a necessity to work remotely for many people but also a way for people to meet online and spend time together so overall i think that this year for the overall pc market was a good year because it reminded people of how pcs are such great tools uh where you do basically whatever it is that you do uh, be it work hanging out with friends or just playing games and spending time or watching movies or whatever that's something that a smartphone or a console they just cannot give you uh they are very limited devices and people are finally coming to realize this 
This year was also very interesting as far as the world of Linux smartphones goes. Apart from all the dumpster fire that has been going on, we uh, started seeing proper Linux smartphones hit the market this year. Despite all that happened, uh, Pine64 and Purism have shipped their Pine phones and Librem 5s to customers and they're finally in, in people's hands. While the community around the Pine phone has been working hard to get things to work properly with many Linux distributions and mobile desktop environments, the Librem 5 Evergreen uh, happened and it got in the hands of people who bought them and about time and it seems to be doing pretty well. I'm glad to have bought the Bind phone and to be part of this community as being able to use my apps on a proper Linux smartphone and being able to experience this low progress on it before my own eyes and somewhat to the extent that I am able to contribute to it uh, is something that I'm very excited about. There's still a long way to go as far as Linux smartphones go but this year it all got started despite everything else and that's again something that I'm re really excited about. I'm really looking forward to see how the Linux smartphone ecosystem evolves from next year onwards. Something else in the Linux sphere that really happened and was kind of disruptive was the death and rebirth of CentOS as we know it. A very recent news but it's likely to be remembered as one of the most disruptive moments in tech for 2020 is Red Hat moving CentOS in a new direction. CentOS has always been the free, free Red Hat Enterprise Linux so to speak, free rel, uh, and many people used it just because of that, a free as in beer version of Red Hat Linux, one-to-one uh, -one, as close as possible to the origin. But Red Hat has decided to abandon this traditional model for CentOS, focusing instead on their efforts uh, on CentOS Stream. Stream is a very different beast from what CentOS used to be. Uh, you can see it as a sort of a testing ground for the next version of Red Hat. And in a somewhat similar fashion to what Debian testing is to Debian Stable. It's not quite one-to-one, -one, this comparison, but kind of helps you to understand what's going on here. CentOS Stream is, in and of itself, not a bad idea. One of the core ideas being that it, uh, it was to give independent users and developers a possibility to contribute to the development of the next version of Red Hat. But killing regular old CentOS was honestly a bad move. People use it for their servers and workstation as well as a testing ground to evaluate RHEL in their business. Fortunately, in the open source world, a project is never really gone for good if people care about it. The original founder of CentOS, Gregory uh, Kartzer, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, uh, decided to take on the good fight again and started a new CentOS, or an operating system uh, similar to what CentOS used to be. This name will probably be very familiar to you in a couple of years or so, so just remember it, it's called Rocky Linux. Same people, same idea, and same spirit as good old CentOS. Maybe this was a good thing in the end. Uh, giving this kind of opportunity back to the community is probably the best way to ensure its success. Don't get me wrong, CentOS was always a big way for Red Hat to uh, let its uh, potential customers evaluate the platform. But for some reason, maybe at Red Hat, they didn't really see the appeal in the traditional CentOS model. In their eyes, they were shipping two versions of the same operating system, so I don't know. They probably thought that killing it was a good idea. Let's talk about what's new in the PC space, because this year was pretty exciting in that sense too. AMD, finally, they got the crown. This year was um, finally the year that AMD take the top CPU crown with their latest Ryzen 5000 series based on Zen 3. Ryzen CPUs are now better than the Intel counterparts for basically everything, even gaming, something that Intel has long had a small edge in over AMD. And in the GPU space, AMD got even more competitive with Nvidia. With the new 6000 series Radeon GPUs, they're finally competing with Nvidia, even on the high end, with their RX 6900 XT competing with the Nvidia 3090, the top GPU Nvidia has to offer. And with Linux gamers, we sure love us some sweet, sweet open source drivers, am I right? In the meantime, Intel has probably woken up and it looks like their new CPUs using a technology similar to Big Little in the ARM space could be able to give AMD a run for its money. Let's see, surely Intel has been stagnating for long enough and they deserve this in a way, but hopefully they get back on track soon, bringing again more competition to the market. 
But let's not just talk about the x86 space. Uh, this year also represented a new dawn for ARM, as they have finally made a big move in the mainstream PC market. With the release of their ARM-powered Macs, Apple has proven that yes, ARM is capable of being a full desktop grade CPU technology. Unfortunately, we are yet to see other mainstream offerings that really have been an impact on the market as big as Apple's from other companies. And yes, there are some odd ARM Windows laptops out there, but of course, Windows doesn't really work mostly at all on ARM because of its old and crusty architecture. But Linux, well, that's another story. Provided the SoC is probably supported by the kernel, ARM on Linux is just as good as the x86 counterpart. It's one of the benefits of being open source, like most of the software we love. It works virtually on every architecture. Unfortunately, we still don't have any truly mainstream Linux ARM PCs yet, as the only true exceptions that come to mind are the Pinebook Pro and the Raspberry Pi, uh, as well as the newly released as of this year, Raspberry Pi 400. That's probably the closest competitor to, like, I think the ARM Mac Mini from Apple. But all of them are not nearly as powerful as the new Macs, being instead more oriented towards low-cost computing, tinkering and embedded applications, rather than full mass consumption. So if this year was the dawn of ARM in the desktop space, maybe next year or two years from now will be the time that ARM really starts competing one-to-one -one, uh, in the x86 PC space. Finally, let's conclude by talking about what's going on with my apps and the things that I develop. So this year was pretty interesting for me as far as development goes. Being stuck at home most of the time, um, I had more time to dedicate to some side projects and applications that I've been working on. Most of my applications got refined over the years. Um, feeds, Hydra Paper, YIP, Notorious, Jara uh, started. And uh, this was really something that I really wanted to do for a very long time. Uh, Jara, a uh, ready app for Linux that I've been working on. It's getting to a pretty usable state. If you've been using my applications, you're probably wondering what's going on and why you haven't seen any updates as of recently. Well, GTK4 happened, and as soon as I could start working on, on porting my applications, I, I, I just did it. So if you're looking at the repositories for Hydra Paper, uh, Jara, and WhatIP, you will find that they all have uh, GTK4 branches. So I started porting all of those applications over to GTK4, and to be honest, at this point, the porting is now complete. Uh, in all three of them, of course, we're still leaving out uh, Feeds and Notorious. Uh, Notorious, I'm not really too focused on, as it's a very simple self-contained application. I will probably uh, keep working on it and port it to GTK4 or something, but it's kind of in the back of my mind right now. Uh, the other big application that I really want to port is Feeds, as it would really benefit from all the nice features that GTK4 has to offer. The only problem being that, uh, at least last time I tried, um, there were some problems with WebKit GTK uh, and its compatibility with GTK4. I'm still waiting uh, on this to be worked out so that I can start porting feeds over to GTK4. As far as uh, JAR goes, um, if you're using it on the desktop, you will see a very big performance improvement in the GTK4 version as I was able to to make use of some of the optimizations that GTK4 has to offer. As far as Hydra Paper goes, the porting to GTK4 didn't really bring too much on the table, but it was a, a possibility for me to clean up its code and uh, bring it, I don't want to say to the next level, but to a better level than it was before. Um, besides, Hydra Paper is one of my uh, oldest projects at this point, and it's seen many iterations over the years. One other thing that I've been working on on top of the GTK4 port of, of Hydra Paper is finally adding a daemon to it. So Hydra Paper, if you don't know, it's an application to set uh, multiple wallpapers for different monitors on Linux. Uh, it supports different desktop environments, uh, including GNOME, um, Mate, Cinnamon, Budgie, and pretty sure it supports Pantheon as well. The addition of a background daemon to Hydra Paper will allow me to introduce features such as uh, slideshow mode, so automa automatically changing wallpapers 
um, that change every uh, seconds or whatever. It's very configurable. Uh, or other features like the possibility to uh, reset the wallpaper if the uh, monitor configuration changes. Uh, one of the longest ending bugs of Hydropaper uh, is caused by the fact that it's really based on a workaround for a, a lack of a feature in GNOME. Uh, and uh, desktop environments based around the same technologies as GNOME. You cannot set a different wallpaper for a different monitor on GNOME as uh, as of never, as far as I know. Um, but it is possible to set a single wallpaper as uh, spanning uh, multiple displays. So what I do in Hydra Paper is basically stitch together different pictures and set them all as a single uh, span wallpaper over multiple monitors. But this approach, of course, uh, has some problems. Um, for example, if you uh, use a laptop and unplug your uh, secondary monitor after, after some time, what happens is that uh, the two wallpapers just condense into a um, compressed one into one single monitor. And while it doesn't really break anything, it uh, it's kind of ugly and it's something that I always wanted to try and fix, but I knew that I needed something that was always active, so a daemon to do this. And I didn't really like the idea of having a daemon lying around in the system just for an application to set your wallpaper. But at the end of the day, I just figured out that Hey, if you want to do this, you're going to do it anyway. And having like some more kilobytes in RAM uh, used up by a small daemon doesn't really matter too much. So I just went ahead and created this daemon. And it also gave me the possibility to add uh, the slideshow or the changing wallpaper feature that I wanted to add for a very long time. So overall, this year has been kind of weird. Uh, difficult for the most part, but also gave us the possibility to explore new things, to explore new ideas, and to, well, change our perspective if nothing else. I'm really glad that this year is over, because it really represented a, a very strange moment in history, and definitely the strangest year of my whole lifetime. So guys, all that's left to say is, thanks for watching, happy new year, and I'll see you in the next one.